Hey, hey, hey. You know, uh, I, I just got into wine by drinking it. I mean, it's, uh, it's sort of a natural thing. I was really into food first. As a teenager, I, I kind of discovered the pleasures of eating and uh, eventually the, the uh, joy of cooking. And wine is always on the table, just like another, uh, another dish, another grocery, a staple. And I got to, um, to really enjoy it, not just for what was in the glass, but for the, um, uh, the synergy of it. Wine would make food better, food would make wine better, the two would make conversation better, and when you, when you get that magic formula of great food, great wine, great friends, family, it, it, that's wonderful. It, it is a wonderful thing, and that's kind of how our business evolved, that we were kind of talking off camera about some of the wine cabinets were here in a in an in a apartment in New York City on the 21st floor where we built this wine cabinet. Um, the customer came to us and kind of you know said that I want to have a meeting spot for the family to be able to share wine over dinner and so forth. It's really what's propelled the restaurants in New York City of farm to table and kind of slowing time down. Um, and that's interesting that that long ago that that's how you got into you know your passion became your business, I guess, for lack of a better word. Yeah, I, I never really anticipated that. Um, you know, I went into journalism because I uh, basically needed a job. Right. And, um, you know, working in journalism, I just ended up gravitating to writing about food and then and then wine. Actually, the uh, the first article I ever published in, in the New York Times food section was about beer. Which you are a big fan of. I, I am, yeah. And this was back in the, uh, the mid-80s, uh, sort of the, the beginning of the craft beer movement in, in New York City, which always trailed other parts of the country. Sure. And then became the under 20? Under 20? Uh, under, it was called $25 and under. And, under. Um, and that, uh, for 12 years, I reviewed uh, inexpensive modest restaurants in, in New York City, restaurants there, that there are, are inexpensive? Uh, there used to be. Um, you know, that, that definition uh, proved to be a little bit elastic after a while. At first it was some, somewhat literal, you could get a meal for under $25, eventually it was just the, the idea that this suggested a, a more uh, inexpensive dining experience. But, uh, I mean, and that was great. I, I love restaurants, I love uh, food of all different kinds. I loved uh, discovering different corners of, of New York City. Um, you know, I, I'm far, I, I'm a little bit sad uh, since I stopped doing that 10 years or so ago. Uh, you know, I feel like my territory has gotten smaller and smaller and, and you know, I have less reason to, to go out to some, uh, you know, neighborhood in the tip of the Bronx or, or somewhere deep in Brooklyn. But What's cool about um, that experience is like I look at now all the different wine regions that have popped up around the world and you know whether it's in you know Slovak, it, it, everywhere, everywhere yeah. is making good wine right now. Some of your favorite regions, is there anything? Um, you know I, I love uh, traditional regions, places where they've been making wine for, for centuries. Um, because it's such a deep part of the, the culture there. Um, <clears throat> and you realize that when you're writing about wine, you're not just, you're not writing about aromas and flavors in a glass somewhere. You're writing about a, a people, you're writing about heritage, uh, history, um, personalities, how uh, these people adapted to a particular part of, of the world, uh, the grapes they planted. Um, Soil. You know, there's so much to it that uh, fascinates me, and um, you know, it's just the uh, uh, what's in the glass is the tip of the expression. Um, you know, 
know, it goes so much more deeper. Sure, than, absolutely. The personality behind it, the traits of the, you know, the terroir. And yeah, and um, in 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 the new world, it, it evolves in a slightly different way. Um, you know, so much of, of old world wines were the products of a of a community. Uh, new world because it's all. Um, you know, beginning much later, uh, at a much later historic point, uh, wines tend to reflect the uh, an entrepreneur uh, rather than a community. Sure. You, know, uh, uh, you can't say, for example, that um, you know Napa Napa Valley Cabernet reflects the uh, the history of Napa Valley so much as it might reflect the the mind and determination of of Robert Mondavi and several like-minded uh, pioneers there. Yeah, they so definitely a, expanded. Yeah. Um, in talking about that, what do you think about the changes in California over the last eight to ten years? Um, <clears throat> I think it's uh, it's terrific. You know, um, I think that uh, California has a, a history of, of diversity. Um, they need wines from all sorts of grapes there um, in many different styles. And then in the 90s, uh, this diversity kind of uh, contracted, and it's partly because of, of critics who um, sort of universally applauded certain styles and the effect of their critical acclaim. I mean, the, the economic impact of, uh, you know, People like Parker and The Spectator was so demonstrable that people just climbed on this train, and uh, you ended up with uh, you know a, a dominant style. It's not it never completely wiped out uh, the the diversity that's wonderful about California, but it it became dominant, and in the last I would say seven or eight years now. Um, you've seen sort of a, a, a rediscovery of the diversity. Um, more subtle, more complex, more... And, and a greater uh, variety of, of wines, you know, it's not all just Cabernet and, and Chardonnay right now, Merlot, Pinot Noir, the classic uh, French grapes, but, uh, you know, aside from a, a new appreciation of people who have been making wines in this uh, more restrained style for many years without uh, deviation. You've got a, a younger generation of, of winemakers who have traveled the world, who have tasted wines that, you know, were not available 25 years ago. Sure. Wines from the Jura in, in France and Sicily and, you know, different regions in, in Spain back in the 80s or, or early 90s, you never heard of these wines in this country that were basically unavailable. Right. Um, now, you know, you go to uh, any wine shop in, in New York City, you're going to find wines from the Jura, you're going to find uh, champagnes from grower producers that, uh, you know, this was not, just not a part of the market right. 20 years ago. And the, this new generation of California winemakers has been influenced by this, and, and why not? Right. Yeah, that's exactly right. Why not? We were talking a little bit off camera with, with Joe and, and Eric about, you know, Finger Lakes and what I, where I just came from, Niagara on the Lake, which had some phenomenal Rieslings and so forth. The quality of wine has never been better. It's amazing. Uh, the quality of wine has never been better, and the, um, the selection has never been better. It's why, uh, you know, I just think of this as the, the greatest time in history. To, to love wine because you've got um, such a diversity of, of styles and grapes from you know so many different places that uh, you know you can discover something new every every day if you wanted to. So here, here's a great question that Joe and I get all the time after building something like this cabinet, which is halfway full. What should I fill it with? What would be your suggestion? What's a you know. Um, that's a great challenge, and uh, it depends on your on your habits. Uh, for someone like me, I mean, I drink wine every day, um, almost without exception, and uh, I want wines that are, are going to age uh, for five, ten, fifteen 
years, you know, that kind of reaches the, the limits of my actuarial uh, 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 expectations. Um, but I also want wines that are, uh, I'm going to be able to drink uh, immediately. So I would uh, mix it up with uh, wines that I'm not going to touch for, for 10 years. Um, get wines that, I'm, that are going to be great in, in three or four or five years and get a bunch of wines that I can just drink every night. Right. And I'm going to go for, for all kinds of styles because I, I mean, I love uh, champagne, white wines, I love red wines. I probably drink an equal amount of, of both. Uh, I like wines from, from all over the world. I'm not so much of a... Uh, of a collector as I am a drinker. Right, which is a good thing. We're, yeah, Joe and well, I are both collectors. It's, but yeah. also it's, a good, it's a good thing, but you know, if you're if you're looking at it uh, from an economic or an investment point of view, it it, it helps to uh, be extremely focused and disciplined. Sure. Well, that's a, that's a big thing that Eric said is that we try to teach our clients to layer out their cellars or cabinets and so forth, so that they're drinking wines when they're meant to be drunk. Yeah. Not just buying things because it's a 100-point wine or 98-point wine or something that they are, feel safe with. That's what I try to, we try to really tell our clients is that, you know, it's easy to walk into a wine shop and see 96, 97, 98. It, 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 it's almost meaningless because it has no idea what your personal palate is. It, I would say completely meaningless. Right. Um, because, well, you know, it... If you want to go to a, you want to buy your wines from a, a, a great wine shop, uh, people who understand wine, people who are, are passionate about it, people who store it correctly. And I always think if you're, if you go into a wine shop and you see, you know, scores from some publication posted, that means that people have completely abdicated their own responsibility sure. of, of uh, making recommendations and, and, uh, indi and Using their own personal judgment, they're just they're just merchants, and they're, they could sell whatever they want. Sure. If you're a, a passionate wine shop, a wine merchant, then you've stocked it with things that you love, uh, things that you th think are great, and you take a personal interest in in your, your, your clients right. and and matching them with things that they uh, will like, will love. Or even don't know that they'll love, but will. Right, and we Joe and I call those toll collectors. They're basically just putting something on the shelf and you know getting a piece of that. So, uh, tell us about the pour. Um, well, that's one of the columns that I write yep. uh, at the Times. Um, I actually write three different columns right now. Um, you know, the pour is uh, it, it. It's an opportunity to talk about. Uh, Issues, personalities, uh, specific uh, sorts of wines. It's it's personal, uh, and opinionated, and um, I I hope uh, through reading it, people are either going to uh, be turned on to new sorts of wines, or become curious, or more comfortable, uh, more at ease with wine. Um, it serves all, all kinds of uh, purposes. Okay, and what is your um, opinion about the point rating system? Um, I think it's uh, it, it's really useless. Um, you know, if you know people who who are rating wines are, are tasting wines en masse, they're they're you know it could be any, anywhere from twenty to a hundred wines at, at a time. They're, they're sniffing, tasting, spitting, moving on. And if you know uh, good wine, you understand that it's a, a living thing. It changes uh, depending on the context, you know, the weather, uh, outside, the temperature that the wine is served at, how long the bottle is open, the food you're going to eat with it, um, the people you're with. And all, all of these considerations uh, uh, provide an, an important context for uh, how that wine will will please you, and how it how it will uh, taste in general. Um, the hundred point scale uh, does away with context. Uh, it rates everything on an on one universal scale, 
and it, it leads people to believe, not uh, understandably, that uh, a 95.1 is always going to be better than an, an 85.1. Right. But there are times, and probably more times than not, when that 85.1 is going to be better than right. the 95.1. And much cheaper. And much cheaper. So, I mean, what do you, um, what do you, what's the criteria for judging it? Um, you know, every night, if you if you drink wine, you're making a decision that's based on on different things: what you're eating, who you're with, what the occasion is. You can't use one scale to to make those judgments. Um, and you know, you you I, I believe strongly in drinking rather than tasting. Um, I have to taste professionally, um, and, and it is work. It is work. I, I get. I've gotten good at it. Most wine professionals are pretty good at extrapolating how that wine is going to taste uh, if they were actually drinking it. You want to tell us about the book? Yeah. Um, which book? You start. Um, well, uh, it's. Uh, my first book about wine is just out in paperback now. It's called uh, How to Love Wine. It's a uh, memoir and manifesto. Excuse me for one second. Excellent read. I recommend it to all of our clients, seller people, people that are just love wine, not just people that are collecting wine. It's a very, very good read. Thank you. I appreciate You're that. Um, and, you know, I, I wrote the book primarily because uh, uh, as the wine critic for the mm -hmm. times, uh, people frequently confess their anxieties about wine to me. They say, oh, I, you know, I like wine, but I don't, I don't get it, I don't understand it. People use all these terms, these smells and flavors and these fruits, and I never heard of, you know, where do they get this stuff? I guess I'm just not, I don't have the right equipment. I, I guess I'm not I wired that way, right. Yeah. So, you know, they, they've observed the uh, contemporary American wine culture, and it doesn't make sense to them, and they've concluded that they are the problem. There's something wrong with them that they right. don't get it. And uh, I decided it was the other way around. You know, most people are, are perfectly equipped to enjoy wine, to love wine, um, but we scare them with the idea that, that wine is something that's completely rational. You can boil it down to a score and then some tasting note with uh, esoteric fruits and other descriptors there. Um, and, and we've turned it into something where you feel you have to be a connoisseur first before you can simply enjoy wine. Correct. And that's, to me, that's backwards. Right. You want, wine is an emotional attachment. You you fall in love with it, uh, just as you would, um, you know, other things that you like, opera or skiing or, or whatever, literature, dance, jazz, uh, you fall in love with wine. And, and if you love it enough, then you dig into it and you, um, you learn all of the things that can make wine more than simply enjoyable, that can make it profound. But you don't have to do that. You can enjoy it on the most uh, uh, simplistic, uh, superficial level, and for many people, that's enough. Right. That's a fantastic um, assessment. That's one of the amazing things about the book. It kind of, you know, we're always asked, "What what should I fill in the cabinet, in the cellar?" You know, and I look at people and I say, "What do you like?" You know, it's not just a matter of what I like or what Joe likes or what the wine shop that we're recommending likes. It's what do you like? How do you eat? You know, are you having fish? Are you having pasta? There's no one wine. When I always, most of our customers will go, you know, I basically drink red wine. Why? You know, are you trying rosés? Are you trying champagnes with different things? I mean, I, you know, you're having oysters tonight in, in a big Cabernet from California. That, you know, makes no sense. But they have to kind of be made to feel like it's okay to try different things and not feel exactly like the critic. It's okay to... I've been to so many tastes, and I'm sure you have that. Someone will say, "Here, try this. It's a hundred point wine. You know, drink it." And I walk away going, "Yeah, you know, it was six hundred dollar bottle of wine, and I wasn't blown away." Whereas, I'm more blown away when I find a forty five dollar bottle of wine that you know I feel like I could open up a couple times a week, 
and not the $600 bottle of wine. And, and, and maybe it's rated 86, like you were saying. And that's where I think the, the, the book takes you. And I think you've done a fantastic job with Thank it. Thank you. You know, um, people's tastes change right. over time. Sure. And, uh, you know, sometimes we're just so uh, wed to an opinion that we expressed in the past or, or something we heard that we're reluctant to acknowledge a, a change in, in taste or just an evolution. Um, you know, you don't have to be right all the time with, with wine. And you know, very often there is no right or wrong. Right. But, um, you know, too often we assume uh, this wine is good, or this wine is bad, or you know, red wine is more serious than white wine, or, or you know, there's so much uh, conventional wisdom that gets in the way of, of simple pleasures. Whether it tastes good or not. Yeah. That's you, know, a little... you don't have to decide that uh, a wine is on on some objective scale is great or or not. It's right. it, it starts with whether you like it. Right. Do you have any? Um not just regions, but any actual vineyards like from California or so forth that's on your radar that you think are up and coming? Um, well, the, uh, there are uh, regions that, you know, for whatever reason have not really been um, uh, appreciated as well as, as maybe they should be. Uh, Santa Cruz mm -hmm. Mountains is a, a perfect example. Um, it's uh, historic. You know, some of the, the greatest American wines of the, the middle of the 20th century came from there. Uh, Martin Ray, the original Paul Masson before it became a, a, a brand name with, uh, with Orson Welles. Um, and now you've got, uh, you know, classic uh, wines, whether it's um, Mount Eden Chardonnay or Ridge Montebello uh, in that region. And, and one of the greatest um, new producers, uh, Reese, R-H-Y-S, that makes uh, sensational Pinot Noirs and, and uh, Chardonnays is based there. But, but it's very small, it's, uh, you know, it's not touristy, um, and it doesn't, you know, it doesn't produce a lot of wines, but it's really worth uh, checking out. Um, and of course, you know, I, I don't think these are undiscovered areas, but the true Sonoma Coast, um, uh, you know, the, the region right just inland from, from the uh, Pacific there is making uh, wonderful wines. Mendocino, are terrific Love wines. Yeah. Is there um, a particular grape that is your favorite? No. Um, you know, I love, I love so many different grapes and um, you know it's it, it's very hard to be put on that that sort of spot you know I might if I were to say Pinot Noir then I would say well what about Nebbiolo and I'm forgetting about Riesling and Chenin Blanc and Chardonnay and, um, and Sangiovese I love Sangiovese and, and, you know, and occasionally I want uh, Sauvignon or Trousseau and uh, Tempranillo, Benthia. That's awesome. So there's all of the above. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. Is there a spot, uh, you have a website that our readers and viewers will be able to either purchase the books or learn more about oh, it? Oh, you know, the books, uh, you can get in any bookstore, any um, e-dealer. We'll link to them on the website underneath the article. Fantastic. Um, I have a new book that's out that it's called Wine and Food. And uh, it's written with Florence Fabricant, who provides uh, wonderful recipes. And this is um, based on uh, columns that uh, I've written for the Times. Um, but I'm taking like one particular wine or one particular genre, um, giving sort of a brief capsule description of it. And Florence has added recipes that go with uh, those wines. And, um, you know, it's not meant to be fetishistic about pairing wine and food, I think that can be really uh, overblown. Uh, but these are just combinations that work. That's fantastic. I know our viewers will absolutely love that. Uh, Eric, it was a pleasure to spend some time with us today. Thanks so Joe, much. I really Eric. much appreciate it. We'll link to the website. Great job, Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate Thanks. it.